So to answer the first two questions really quickly that you might be wondering, yes, I have a wedding today, and yes, Sandy dressed me. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, all right. We are excited to see everyone in, in this uh, kind of combined service, and uh, it's really cool. And we've been uh, studying the Christmas message uh, from a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, some of you may have, uh, have journeyed down this path before. For some of you, this may be your first time. And for your kids, uh, this may be uh, a little more complicated to kind of explain to them because we all know that when we gather together on the Christmas uh, story, we always generally turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And we begin with the shepherds, and we begin with uh, Mary and Joseph making their journey to Bethlehem. But we've been studying the last few weeks that uh, when Matthew set out to tell his story of uh, the coming of Christ and, and the, uh, uh, the birth of Jesus, he started out a little different. He gave us a little bit of a historical perspective, a little bit of a family tree. And, and so there were some reasons for that. Uh, we all have studied our family tree at one time or another, and it's always been kind of interesting. Now we have DNA testing, and people do uh, Ancestry uh, org and those kinds of things, and they send off DNA. And I can tell you, being a pastor, sometimes when those DNA results come back, I get phone calls. Uh, so there's interesting things that can happen there when you do it that way. But everybody likes to look back in the past, see where you come from, and who, who knows? Are we related to presidents, artists, musicians? It's always fun to learn about um, our family history. But Matthew goes back, uh, before he begins the story of how the birth of Christ came about, he traces a family tree. And if we're understanding that Matthew wrote his gospel, if he wrote his account of his time with Jesus, he wrote it to Jewish people because he himself was a Jew. And, and one of the first things, they've been looking for the Messiah for a long time up to this point, right? We're still back 2,000 years ago. And, and, and so, but for thousands of years prior to that, they're looking for the coming of the Messiah. To really understand, we've been reading through the F-260 plan this year, to really kind of put this into full perspective, there had been 400 years of silence from God. No word from prophets, no word from anyone, and they had just been kind of doing their thing. Now, you think about that. America is a little over 230 years old, and we've been doing our thing for quite some time, and you look at the changes and the things that we've... But in this period of particular time, the people had been worshiping at the temple and bringing sacrifices for over 400 years without really anything new. Without any new revelations, without any change, it was just kind of just going through this process. They had been uh, captured and had been uh, ruled by Rome during this time. And so they are really looking for something fresh. And, and there had been multiple times when people had risen up and everybody asked the question, could that person be the Messiah? Could that person be the Messiah? They asked those questions as these people would rise up. Well, Matthew is about to tell the story of the Messiah. But understand, from a Jewish perspective, first question they're going to have is, does he come from the line of David? Because if he doesn't come from the line of David, in some shape, form, or fashion, it's not going to work. You're going to have to flesh that out. And so it makes sense that he would include the family history uh, before he got into any accounts of time that he spent with, with Jesus or how, how the baby was actually born. The problem is that if you read this from that perspective, it's like, okay, he would start with the family history. You would read the family history and say, it's there. It does its job. It traces it to Joseph. We'll just turn the page and get on with it. But what you find is that he included names. He included names in the family history that he didn't have to include. Matthew wrote names into the family history that he did not have to include in order to show the line of David. He could have left some names out. But instead, he chose to include them. And so when you read through it and you find those names and they kind of pop out at you, you realize that it's been 2,000 years since he wrote this. It pops out at us. Can you imagine how this popped out at the people of his time? When, when this came to people's hands the first time and they begin to read Matthew's account of Jesus, as they begin to read this lineage, as they begin to read this family history, names would pop up that would make them say, hmm, wonder why he included these names. As a matter of fact, he goes out of his way to introduce us to some characters that have some questionable reputations. Uh, we've looked at a couple of those already in the last couple of weeks. So why would he include these characters? Why would he put this here? Well, one of the things that I, and I want us to all understand is that they're part of the story, okay? They are truly part of the, of the history of Jesus. They're, they're very much a part of his family of his family tree, as we trace back through Joseph. But Matthew was about to unfold the story of the birth, the life, the teaching, and the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And, and as, we, as we see this, it, Matthew himself had been redeemed. 
Matthew himself had been forgiven and welcomed in and asked to come and follow and be a part of this movement. The, the, the God in the flesh, the Son of God himself, Jesus came to the Matthew while he was standing in a tax collector's booth, stealing money from his own people. Jesus said, I want you to follow me. It never, he never got over that. He never got over that moment. And, and so what we begin to realize is that it was important for Matthew to include these folks because it was all these folks, folks like us, is why he came. You see, this is, and this may be even today. Okay, I want you to, I want to take you into the, into the mind of a person in the first century and how they relate to God. Okay, this is, this is kind of where they were at in, in their minds. Most people's minds, a person's relationship to God was based upon their personal works. This is, this is, how, they, this is how they lived. What they had done or what they hadn't done, or what they plan to do or not do. And, and, and this is what this looks like, okay? This is what this looks like in their mind. If I do good, if I live right, then I can get God to cause my crops to grow. My family won't get sick, I won't get sick, and nothing bad will happen to me if I can live good enough to warrant the Lord's protection and favor. You see that way of thinking? I'm just going to tell you, it's the wrong way of thinking, but this is, this is the world, and this is where we get sometimes too. We get in that same place. It's like, well, I, I have not done what I need to do. I haven't gone to church like I need to do. I haven't been as faithful as I need to be. I've said things I shouldn't say. I've been mad. I, and, and so I can, I, I, what I'm now doing is I'm inviting God's wrath upon me, and so I've got to do better. And so it becomes this exchange back and forth of how good can I live my life in order to obtain God's favor on me. And so what they would do in this time period is they would come to the temple and they usually wouldn't bring a sacrifice with them. They would just buy it when they got there. The priests were more than, more than able and more than, more than happy to sell them something that they could sacrifice on their behalf. So it was like, look, it's been a tough year. Uh, what can we do to try to earn the favor of God? What can we give? What can we sacrifice on his? How much is it going to cost me? You see? You see the danger in that line of, how much can I pay? How many lambs can I sacrifice? How many doves can I buy? What can I afford? What can I do in order? And so Matthew understood that this was the mindset of the people that were there. This is 400 years of silence. This was a, a sacrificial system. This was the temple model. This is what people were doing. This was their relationship with God. And, and, and if they had gotten too far away, then they were trying to figure out how they could get back. And here's the thing. This is called self-righteousness. You understand that? That's called self-righteousness. If I do good, if I, it's all I in self-righteousness, right? If I can do enough, then I can gain the favor of God. And if I get out of the favor of God, then what can I do in order to get back into God's favor? This was the problem for Matthew. He was a tax collector. He was too far gone. He was, in his mind, he's too far gone. See, there was two categories, tax collectors and sinners, and he was in the, in the bigger category. And so in Matthew's mind, it's over. I, made, I sold my soul. Okay? In his mind, he sold his soul in order to make money off of his own people. And so there's no, there's no way he can gain favor with God. That's where he was in his mind. And Matthew also knows that all of his tax collector friends are thinking the same way. And, and this is why. Because the church reinforced that idea. Remember, when all of Matthew's tax collector's center friends came to eat with Jesus, what did the church people do? Okay, the religious leaders gathered around outside the house and said, why is he in there eating with those people? While we can't even go up to the door because we can't get ourselves clean enough to go back into the temple because we're so much better than they are. You see the separation? Matthew understood it. He understood that the common person, the guy who was keeping the sheep, the guy who was working out in the fields, the guy who was pouring concrete, the guy who was building houses, it was not, it was not going to happen for him. He couldn't, he couldn't do enough to gain the favor of God. That was Matthew's story. And Matthew understood that Jesus brought with him a new way of thinking. It was a completely brand new concept to God. It, 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 it had been lost in the law, okay? 
It had been lost in the religion of the time. And, and, and so here's the thing. They became so centrally focused <laughs> on God being just for them and for the Jewish people that they forgot that there were multiple times throughout their history that God reached out and brought somebody who wasn't a Jew into the fold. And so Matthew listed these names so that he could get the people's attention. This is what he wanted people to understand. Not only was Jesus a descendant of Abraham, not only was Jesus a descendant of the line of David, but in that, in that lineage there were some people that had some real history. Okay? And Nathan shared with you guys last night, or last week, uh, an interesting story. We, we shared a story a couple, a couple of weeks ago. And these, these folks are not just sinners. These are award-winning sinners, right? These are go big or go home things, right? I mean, this is big stuff. And so these are the kind of people with the kinds of stories that if you had them in your family history, you might want to tend to hide them sometimes. Right? Aren't you related? No, well, we're distant. <laughs> we're distant. Uh, yeah, they've got... Uh, yeah, they're Hilliards, right? They have an I in their, their last name, right? So we, we try to hide that sometimes, okay? These are, these are go big or go home folks. And, and so Nathan shared with you the story of Tamar, and that's one of its uh, exciting in its own right. And, and here's the thing. As we really explore the concept and the idea of what it means to approach God through our own self-righteousness, it, it's like this. Hey, God, could you... Could you bless me and my family and take care of my kids and everything, everything that I own? And, and here's why you should. These are the things that I have stopped doing. These are the things that I've stopped doing. I mean, here's a list of the things that I've done good, and, and here's a list of things that I've, that I've stopped doing. And so I'll just keep doing this list over here and see if I can get this list as long as I, as I can. And here's the thing. Matthew realizes that he is about to launch into a story, okay? He, he is about to tell the story of his time with Jesus that changes that whole concept. The whole idea of I can somehow earn my way to God, he, he is about to change that whole concept. And so we've, we've asked this question uh, over the past couple of weeks, uh, is what is the point of Christmas? What is the greatest gift that God has given? God's gift, not just for the religious elite, not just for the pastors, not just for the priests, but for all people, for all of us. We realize that these characters are not just part of the story, but they are the main point of the story. This morning, we're going to jump into Matthew 1, and we're going to go down to verse 5, and we're going we're to camp out there for a little bit. Because this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, as Matthew writes it. And verse 2 says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. We camped out there last week, right? Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadab, what names? Abinadab the father of Nashon, uh, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, time out. Rahab has a title, doesn't she? Okay, Rahab has a title. If you grew up in church and you, and, you, and you studied the Bible whatsoever at all, that you know that Rahab had a label. There's a lot of Bible characters with labels, right? A lot of, there was John the Baptist, right? There's Uriah the Hittite, Alexander the Great, Attila the Hun, Conan the Barbarian, Buffy the, I'm sorry, I got on the wrong list, didn't I? You're paying attention, aren't you? Okay, all right. Jabba the... Nobody's got hut. Come on, right? Okay, so if you grew up in the King James Bible, you know that she is Rahab the harlot. Now, you can take care of that with your kids later, okay? Um, but the, this created some tension in the genealogy of Jesus. Understand this. 2,000 years ago, Matthew writes this. He hands it out to people who are forming new churches. Jewish people get a copy of this. They read this. And, they look at, and they're looking at his lineage, and then they go down and they see that name. And when they see that name, that name means something to them. That name stands out to them. And, and here's the thing. God has given a law, right? He handed it down to Moses. 
what did the law say that the people were supposed to do to a woman like Rahab? Stone her. Okay? She was to be killed. And so, listen, they understood their histories. They understood the law. And so when they see that name pop up, they're like, oh, man, what's that doing there? That is an interesting concept, isn't it? You see, you, you have to contextualize it a little bit. God, God, you, have to, you have to look a little deeper. You have to look a little farther. Why would Matthew tr- choose to draw attention to Rahab? Because she's part of the story. And she's part of the key to understanding God's gift to all people. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. You guys know the story. We'll go through it real quickly. Joshua had been given the leadership position from Moses. Moses died. It was handed over to Joshua. The people in the past had gone into the land of Canaan. They had sent spies in. They had looked everywhere, and they came back and said, you know, we can, uh, it, it, the people are giants, and we can't do it. And there was Joshua and Caleb saying, we can't. And they said, nope, we're not. So they, they, they wandered for 40 years, for 40 years. And now it's time to go again. And so they go in. And, and, and they go in to, to, uh, to spy on and look at the, uh, the city of, of Jericho. And so we, we know what happens is they, they, they send in a couple of spies, and they go in, and, and these spies wind up at Rahab's house. All right? They wind up at Rahab's house. And so we look at what happens in this situation because this is her speaking, okay? And so we want to we want to just camp here for just a moment. Joshua chapter two verses eight through fifteen says, "Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and a great fear has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt." And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear. And everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, this is what she says, look at this. This is is a confession, this is a profession of faith. You see this? This is Rahab making a profession of faith. Because she says, the Lord, your God, is God. You see that? She comes to these spies and she says, the Lord, your God, is God. I have seen it. I have heard about it. I have been told of the miracles. I have been told of who he is and what he has done. And he is God. And I know that the Lord has given this land to you. I don't know what language she was speaking, okay? I don't know what language she was speaking, but the translator that translated this in Hebrew chose the highest name for God here. It literally meant the existing one, the name above all names. Rahab said, that God is big as you can believe God is. He placed, she, she placed God above all the idols, other gods that she had encountered, and we believe that this God, your God, the God, has given you this land. And this is what she says in in verse 12. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them. And look at this. You see the two things that she's done here? I believe that your God is God, and I'm asking you to save us from death. Folks, that's not changed. It's still the same. When you recognize who God is, when you recognize that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you ask him to save you from death, he still does. And she recognized, even though she had a past, Even though she had a reputation, she had seen enough, and she had heard enough, and she said, I recognize that that your God is God, and I want help, and I'm asking for your protection. Verse 23, the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. 
And so the story begins to unfold. You know how this all goes. I'm going to go through this really quickly. Uh, those are the, the kids that are with us this morning. Y'all studied the, 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 the uh, battle of, of Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, right? We sang the song. And, and so they went down and they said, okay, what's the battle plan? We're going to bring in uh, catapults. We're going to use flaming arrows. What are we going to do? Okay, no, no weapons at all. All you need is your walking shoes, right? You guys know the story. We're going to go around the city multiple times. We're going to do it seven times. We're going to, on the seventh day, we're going to go seven times, and then we're going to shout. And they did what they were asked to do. They did what God told them to do. And what happened? The whole thing fell in. The walls of the city of Jericho collapsed, and it was bedlam. It was bedlam. There was a lot of Israelites. Some estimate that as many as two million. And it was certainly in the hundreds of thousands. And so the people inside that city were absolutely terrified. But in the midst of that bedlam, in the midst of that craziness, in the midst of all this, God reached in and he saved one family. Joshua 6, says, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house, bring her out, all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young man who had, said, who, had, who had done the spying went in, brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family, put them in a place outside the camp of Israel, and then they burned the city and everything in it. They put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab with her family and all who belonged to her, even though she had a past. Even though she had a history, because she had found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and she had recognized who God was. Now, years later, Matthew is writing this down. He is writing the genealogy of Jesus, and he includes her name. He includes her name. They knew that story. All they had to see was Rahab. And the story that I just shared with you about Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, they knew that story. They'd been read that story, told that story. They knew that story inside and out. What the Bible doesn't tell us is that one day a man named Salmon walks up to Rahab and says, Hey, I've been reading in the book of Numbers, and I don't have yours. And so they get together. Y'all can use that, guys. You're not married. So this Jewish man marries a Canaanite woman, and they have a son and named him Boaz. I don't know why. But when Boaz grew up and was older, he was introduced to a young woman named Ruth, and we shared, she's got her own book in the Bible, right? She's a Moabite. And Boaz and Ruth actually became the great-grandparents of King David. See, the great grandparents of King David. And Matthew places these names right there in the genealogy of Jesus. Because in that time, in that time of the battle of Jericho, we go back 40 years to Moses, and, 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 and God had just given the Ten Commandments that he wrote with his own finger to Moses. And so the idea of the law of God was very fresh. And this woman with a questionable past, with a reputation, with a title, is given grace and allowed to live among the Israelites. You see, remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees and the teachers and the priests when he was eating supper with the tax collectors and sinners? He said, go tell them that I desire mercy more than sacrifice. You guys are trying to figure out what all you can give and all of your self-righteousness to try to earn your own salvation, and that's not what I'm here for. I have come to forgive. There's a price to pay, but it was going to be on him. See, here's the deal for today. I don't think Rahab's story is too far removed from our story. If we were to peel back our own life, we have some labels too. If your thoughts were known, if your private behavior was known, 
things that you don't want anybody to know, then all of us have a label. Some of us have labels that we've just discovered. They might sound like this, liar, cheater, adulterer, greedy, coveter, jerk, addict, jealous, unfaithful. Do you have a label? What happens when we decide to approach God is this. When, when we decide that we're going to go back to church, when we decide, when that friend that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that person that's not on the, uh, in this room today, that person that, that's on your mind, the person that's gone away from church or they don't go to church or they've never accepted Christ, what, what happens is, is when they start making that decision to say, yeah, I think you're, you invite them to Christmas Eve service and they're like, yeah, and, and, then, and then all of a sudden they get reminded of their label. Maybe they remember it on their own. Or maybe Satan holds it up for them to see. And what happens is, is we realize our label, and then we just decide there's no point in even trying. Rahab the harlot. Matthew had a label. Matthew the tax collector. But Jesus walked right up to him. And he, and he didn't say, he didn't say, Matthew, son, you need to clean your life up a little bit. Okay, you need to quit this tax collecting, and you need to find a decent job, and then you need to give all the money back, and once you've got all that done, you come look me up. You see, we, we tend to want to do that. It's like, well, I'm going to get my life straightened up, and then I'll get back in church. It doesn't, that's, not, that's not his plan. That's not what he told Matthew. It's not at all what he told Matthew. He didn't, he didn't walk to the side of Matthew's tax collector booth and say, hey, when you get straightened out, give me a call. He walked right up to him in the sin that he was in and said, come follow me, hang out with me, and bring all your friends too, and let's go have dinner. It doesn't mean that Jesus condones the sin they're in. It doesn't mean that he looks at it and says, oh, I'm okay with you doing that. That's not what it's all about. He, he, he comes and says, I'll, I'll, I'll come in there with you and get you out. I'll come in there with you. I'll help you. I'll come alongside you. You're not so far gone that we can't have dinner. You're not so far gone that we can't sit and talk. You're not so far gone that, that you can't reach out to me. Matthew remembers that day. Caught in the act. Red-handed. Jesus had other situations like that, didn't he? There were other situations. The woman who was caught in adultery. They literally drug her out of bed and brought her right to him and threw her right down. What are you going to do with her? The law versus mercy. He pointed it out, didn't he? Oh, well, we'll stone her. Let's see who's going to throw first. Let's go with the one who doesn't have any sin. And we all stand convicted. And we are convicted. We are convicted. And Matthew is about to tell us the story of Jesus who reached out to people while they were still wearing their label. And that Rahab become the great-great-grandmother of Jesus, which became the whole point of God's gift for everybody. Isn't that powerful? Doesn't that challenge you? The message of Christmas is that God has done for you what you could not do for yourself. We have been invited while we're still wearing our label. We have been invited to a relationship of grace and forgiveness and mercy. You're not hiding anything from God. That person that you're wanting to come to church, they're not hiding anything from him. He already knows. They're not going to catch him by surprise. He makes that clear with his encounter with Matthew. He understood where Matthew was. He walked right up to him. He was caught in the act. He desires mercy rather than sacrifice. Matthew reminds us this is not new. Jesus came for all and he paid the price for all. And don't miss this. <laughs> After that relationship started, he can help us by beginning to chip away at those things 
in our lives. But that doesn't have to happen before the relationship begins. And so here we are. And you may be thinking, you're right. Because I, I have a label. If you knew my thoughts, if you knew how jealous I am, if you knew how much I covet what my friends have, if that's you, let me assure you of something. I don't know, but God does. If that's you, and you've never reached out to Jesus, I've got very good news for you this morning. It's God's gift, and it's for all people. You see, there is a price that has to be paid. The Bible very clearly teaches us the wages of sin is death. And that's why he came. That's the story Matthew's about to write. Matthew already knew the end of the story before he began the story. And that's why he put these people in there. He was like, he came and he died for me. He died for Rahab. He died for all of us. He died for Tamar. He died for, for, for Bathsheba. All of them that are in the story. He died for all of them. Because he went to the cross, and he paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins to give us the mercy and the grace that's available to us. It's God's gift. It's for all people. Listen, I want to invite you to share that story. We have a couple of more weeks before we reach the actual Christmas weekend. So I want you to invite someone to come. Invite someone. Invite someone to hear this message. So that when they, when they finish that YouTube video, they, they lay their phone down or, or their TV remote and they stop for just a moment and say, that's for me. It's a message for them. Whatever it takes. Whatever you need to do to respond this morning. If you need to come and pray for that person or if you need to come yourself and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, today's the day. I want you to come and experience the grace and the mercy, and the forgiveness. Jesus says, come and follow me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you that you loved us so and unimaginably that you put together a plan. At the creation of the world, you put together a plan of redemption. And Father, we have seen that plan unfold. And Father, as Matthew sat down to write his account, of that plan, of his encounter with you, his personal, real encounter with the one true living God. Father, he, he found a God who was merciful and forgiving with grace and acceptance. And Father, the great thing is, is that is still available to us. Father, you know where every heart is this morning. You know where each person is. You know what each mind is thinking. Father, you know, what, you know the innermost uh, parts of us, the innermost of our thoughts. And so, Father, this morning, I, I pray that if there's someone here that's never said yes to the relationship that you offer, if there's someone here that's never said yes and accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray, Father, that they'll come. If there's someone here that has somebody heavy on their heart they need to pray for, I pray that they'll come. Father, in these moments, Father, that we could just reach up to you, Lord, and do what you've called us to do. Father, we pray now that you would help us to be obedient to this time. We pray it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.